everyone, and welcome to today's DataVox webinar, Serving Up Security with FBI veteran James Morrison, presented by HPE. My name is Jessica, and I will be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this webinar through Cisco WebEx events, and the audio can be heard through your PC or by calling into the phone number listed and with the access code provided in your confirmation email or calendar invite for this event. Today's webinar is being recorded on behalf of DataVox, and participation in this event indicates your consent to being included in that recording. All attendees will receive an email with a link to the completed recording 24 to 48 hours post-event. If you have questions for the presenters at any time during this presentation, you may submit those questions via the Q&A feature to the bottom right of your screen. This should already be turned on. Simply click Q&A and the text box will appear. Our panel will be responding to these questions throughout the presentation via text and verbally at the conclusion of the presentation. If you are in need of support or have a question not pertaining to today's topic, please utilize the chat feature and I will be happy to assist you. This feature is separate from the Q&A feature and can be turned on by clicking the chat bubble in the lower center of your screen. Now that we have reviewed the features of this webinar, we would like to start off today's presentation with a few words from our data center solutions architect, Kyle Sandoval. Kyle, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jessica. I appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining this webinar today. Um, hopefully, we'll uh, enjoy the hour going through some unique insights um, from uh, James Morrison. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to listen to James on a couple of uh, uh, occasions, and I can tell you that his insight and what he's seen over the past 22 years as a distinguished technologist uh, at the FBI is, is really insightful. Um, I was uh, listening to him here a couple of months ago. I was understanding that he was actually an active cybersecurity expert in the area of security vulnerability, so I think that helps us. Um, you know, and as, as he starts to talk today to kind of explain the, you know, what they're seeing and what he saw in the field. Um, he was also um, an, an instructor at Quantico, so I think as you listen in today, you'll, you'll um, have a good session, insightful, and be able to, to learn from his uh, ex, uh, experience as well. Some of the stuff he'll cover um, is uh, some of the products that HP um, carries, and we've been uh, successful with our customers in the past uh, a few months with regards to increased cybersecurity, increasing your defense and layers um, across your entire network and stack. So with further ado, I'll pass it over to James. James. All right, thank you for the introduction. And as Kyle said, um, I uh, joined HPE in December of just this last year uh, after retiring from uh, the FBI after 22 years. And uh, um, I've actually done technology. I've been in IT for longer than that. I was eight years military prior to that uh, and then worked for Lockheed Martin, kind of squeezed in between. Um, and, and like a lot of, I guess, people in my, my generation, um, I was in high school when PCs first started taking off. And so I, you know, I taught myself how to program and some of the early, you know, Pascal and Fortran and stuff like that, and and was kind of lucky enough to end up sort of in the security field. But what's interesting about that is, is that you know, when you're in in this field and in IT for that long, is you start to see um, kind of the changes, the good, the bad, the ugly. And so I'm hoping I can sort of share with you some of that, those insights, um, kind of talking about where computer crime has gone or where's it where's it come from where's it going and sort of the threat picture that um, we built you know over the years in the FBI um, uh, one of the ideas of course is that you know the HP this is one of our big pushes is the idea that um, really where IT is going is it's becoming more edge centric cloud enabled and data driven um, and it's uh, I, I've, I actually do some blogging and with the uh, with the COVID I've called this the unplanned IT transformation uh, a lot of companies, you know, try to plan out, you know, what they're going to do over the next you know, two, three, five years. Um, and if if life uh, ever stayed that, the way that we thought it would, then we'd actually make it to those plans. Um, I think it was Napoleon said that uh, no plan survives contact with the enemy. Um, and so, but it's, it still means that we have to plan and we have to sort of try to get to that 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 destination that we're, we're aiming for. But I think each one of us can kind of sit there and, and look at this broad picture of, of what this, the COVID pandemic has done to us. And I'm here in the Houston area. And so I've, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I've been here since 74 and it's, it's an interesting uh, time sort of watching how, how Texans are responding to this and, um, and, and kind of where things are going. But um, when, you were th when we thought edge centric, it was always the idea that our data would be pushed closer to the edge um, and we would have to come up with new ways of sort of managing that data. 
and, and in that in that vein, HPE has really you know talked about enabling all of its uh, features in the cloud. And by 2022, our CEO Antonio Neri has said that he wants to provide everything as a service in the cloud. This, this XAAS sort of idea, um, and yet what we're seeing right now is now it's not just you know data that's generated by our customers, but now it's actually our employees that are closer to the edge. And how many of us are seeing where, where is our security model? You know where are our our fallback? Where you know what new challenges have we come come into? Um, I've told a lot of people in cybersecurity. I've had a lot of conversations with kind of local you know friends and and you know compatriots. And what I would offer initially uh, is get a log going. Log the experiences that you're having right now because what's going to happen is, is as we start to come out of this and start to enter whatever the new normal is going to be, there's a lot of lessons learned that um, will help us really map out that transformation that we want to get to. So how, how close is your data to the edge? How secure is that data at the edge? How cloud enabled are you? Um, I think the world we're going into is not really going to be, um, you know, uh, I think there's more going to be hybrid cloud. We're not going to see a lot of fully fully cloud enabled companies. So, you know, what 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 is your idea of of the cloud, and what is your your hope for it? Will it leverage a better customer experience? Will it leverage a better employee experience? Um, so uh, that's where a lot of our security is building into is into that that uh, you know edge to cloud experience. But then when we look at data, for example, um, what, how are you managing your data? Um, data transformations right now are, are enormous. And a lot of companies are really trying to engage in what I would call the, the Facebook, Google mindset, where they're taking a lot of customer data and transforming it into marketing data that they can then either use for their own needs or sell to an external source. Um, and and there's a, it's a new stream of revenue, and it's it's going to continue to be a big part of that process. Um, well, what's also interesting is I, I laugh about when when I start my first PC, first computer I, I dealt with was a Timex Sinclair back in 1981, and it had 2K of RAM, and you could you could purchase an extra 2K of RAM, and I think it was like a thousand dollars for 2K of RAM. And the first hard drive we bought for school well, when I went to school here in the Houston area at a private school. But we bought a five meg hard drive, and I think it was way over, it was like $3,000 or something for a five meg hard drive. Now we're in a world where, where data is, is exploding, and we estimate that there's going to be, by uh, 2025, 175 zettabytes of data being produced annually. That's an enormous number. Um, and so what's your portion of it going to be? What's also interesting about this particular data number is, is that um, I mean, when I was doing computer systems, I was an old Novell sysadmin. I was a, I did Sun Solaris sysadmin and DEC Ultrix and a lot of older stuff like that. But in 2000, when Windows 2000 comes out and we start to see that merger of the Windows uh, 95, 98 with the NT environment, we started to see this, this net, our networks were being built in a very north-south way, a north-south you know, mantra, where we had a firewall and we had a border router and, and our, everything went up through that stack. Our current systems aren't that way anymore. 75% um, of the data that we are producing is coming east-west in our network, which means our networks are getting flatter, they're getting broader, and because of things like the cloud and, and VPNs and, and uh, you know, BYOD, we have more people accessing our data uh, from more directions than we've ever had. And how much more is that the truth now with people working from home? There's a security statement that says, you're only as secure as the least secure network you are connected to. So you are now uh, trying to extend your security uh, border out to home networks. And then those home networks are also connecting up to social media. They're also connecting up to who knows whatever else, you know, school networks. And so we have this, this when we talk about infection, you know, not necessarily from a COVID standpoint, but the ability of malware and, and viruses and software to move laterally within your network, where's that gonna put you? Because wherever your data goes, security has to follow. Um, security was always a bolt-on. It was something that we threw on the back end of our, our, our transformation, hoping that it would be enough. That's just not good enough anymore. Security has to be more built in, and we need to know that we can trust the data that we're seeing on our network. 
Um, I've talked to a lot of oil and gas, you know, uh, companies in the Houston area and petrochemical companies, and they have these operational networks that monitor things like pipelines and uh, these chemical plants. And they have to know that the data coming in from those sensors is valid and it is, it is timely. And it's becoming the same way with our, our computer networks inside companies. We have to make sure that we can monitor every device. We have to make sure that we can trust every, everything that touches our data. And if we can't, then we need to take an a action, a positive action to kick it out. So what that means is that means cybersecurity needs a much more holistic approach. Um, data is your currency, but data is also the currency of the bad guy. These bad guys are out there buying your data or selling your data and then trying to use it to exploit you. So things like ransomware, ransomware is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, uh, and the FBI, I think one, one week or two weeks ago said that we are seeing a 150% increase in, in uh, ransomware traffic and a 400% increase in scams and phishing. Those are the tip of that sphere, the tip of that attack that's coming after your network. And, and uh, in the Houston area, when we had Tropical Storm Imelda come through, we saw an exponential increase in the amount of ransomware attacking uh, companies out in the Beaumont and the Golden Triangle area because they knew that the, the bad guys were reading the newspaper just like everyone else, and they are targeting places that are in crisis. They know the people are, are uh, distracted. They know that the people are somewhat compromised, and they figure that there is a, it's a golden opportunity for them to actually gain access into these corporate networks. So this very loud attack, this ransomware, this phishing, this uh, you know, denial of service attacks are on the rise. We'll talk about that here in a second too. But they're looking at this saying, if I can, if I can you know, hit you with so much noise and I can gain access to your network, are you gonna pay me to get it back? And so ransomware uh, and, and the maze ransomware, which we've seen kind of rise up in the last probably you know, 15, 18 months, uh, is not just a, a attack against your network from a, let me encrypt your data, but it's also a data, uh, they're gonna steal your data as well, they're gonna exfiltrate your data. So what happens is they see it now, they have three opportunities to get money out of you. They can get money out of you for the ransomware, maybe you'll pay, maybe you won't. They're then gonna turn around and say, oh, by the way, we stole your data, and if you don't want us to put that data out in the public, you know, uh, you're gonna have to pay us an addition. And the third thing is, is that if they're going to hit you with compliance. Yes, the bad guy is going to come to you and say, oh, by the way, uh, you have HIPAA data here, or you have a breach notification. Did you notify the state of Texas about your breach? If you didn't, they're going to notify the state of Texas that you were breached. So it's, it's, a, it's a very nasty you know, way of trying to get multiple ways of getting money out of you. So loss of function is that weapon. And, and what's interesting now, because uh, when we thought, you know, from ransomware was always sort of targeted against that front end, you know, and targeted against, uh, you know, uh, our, our, our data that was provided to our customer. But now because of our employees also having to, you know, access our network, they're coming in through VPN tunnels, they're coming in through Citrix gateways, and the, the bad guys are looking for that, uh, those gateways to hit with denial of service attacks. So we've seen an exponential rise in the number of denial of service attacks targeting specifically the remote accesses that your employees are using. Um, so um, this isn't gonna go away. Uh, Cybercrime is not some sort of flash in the pan. And, and if I can encourage you for anything, you need to start having a plan. Build an incident response plan, use whether it's a NIST framework or the SANS framework, but build a response plan and, and test that plan. Um, I, I can't tell you the number of companies I go to and I say, well, so what's your incident response plan? And they don't have one. Um, and, and I'm kind of sitting there scratching my head as they're trying to make up these decisions sort of on the fly. It's a bad time to do it. It really isn't the right time. You know, we saw those municipalities. We saw 14 municipalities here in East Texas get hit. And I responded to some of those, some of those ransomware attacks. And I'd be standing there in the room uh, as two elected officials, maybe three elected officials, were there with part-time IT people, and they were trying to decide what to do next. Um, and I just, you know, I'm not allowed really to provide advice at that point in time because I was still in the FBI, but it was very distressing because they were, they really didn't know how to get things like 911 services back online and these critical, these critical, you know, services. Um, so have a plan, 
test the plan, and that plan needs to have three parts to it. Protect, detect, recover. What's your plan for protecting its new vulnerabilities? What is your, you know, what, do you have technology? Do you have uh, people, processes? What are you doing, and, and how are you protecting? How are you gonna detect the intruder? Um, so an incident, having an intrusion detection, you know, uh, whether it's host-based or, or uh, um, network-based intrusion, because I'm predicting, and this is part of the thing I've been blogging about, is that over the next four to six months, a lot of companies are going to find out that they found some that there is someone inside their network that gained access during the COVID pandemic, and then you're going to be they're going to be in your system for four months, six months. What are you going to do? What kind of damage could they do if you don't get them out of that network? And then the backside of it is, what's your recovery plan? The first thing criminal activity is going to do is go after your backups. If your backups are available online, if they, you know, I mean, I've seen a lot of companies, they had just a Buffalo, you know, drives, you know, hard, co hard connected to their main server with no rotation of, of those, of those uh, drives and they lost their backups. So what are you going to do? Uh, because time is money. So you're, you're a company, you're in business. If you're down for, you know, let's say 14, 16 days, which is the average that you're, oh, it, that you're completely down 100%. The average cost for that is $20,000 per day. And the data breach, the cost is $143 per record. So it's going to take you 45 days to 60 days to come completely back online 100%. So you have to have a recovery plan, and you have to know that plan cold when the things happen. When you have backups, test your backups. I mean, something very simple is that. But, um, I mean, I did a presentation last week for a healthcare group talking about just building an incident response plan. Test your backups. Make sure that those backups are gonna do what, they're, what you want them to do and that they're, they're backing up the data that's necessary to get back online. Uh, but it's really crucially important. People always ask me, they said, why, why is cybercrime so out of control? And I really track it back to 2013. In 2013, we saw uh, really the first large scale attack against a retailer with the attack on Target. And what the, the cyber criminals realized is they realized how lucrative it is if they can, they can exploit companies online. What also happened there is that the, those programmers, those people that were out there, the really smart people that are programming some of this malicious software, they realized that they could market or they could license their software and, and hide themselves somewhat from prosecution. So those programmers went out, they write this code, they go and sell the code or license the code through the dark web, and you now have ransomware as a service out there on, on the dark web. That's why the FBI, one of the places that the FBI really has been focused, along with Europol and Interpol, has been focused on knocking down these dark, dark marketplaces, because these are the places that this malware is sold. Um, even with all of that, in 2019, it was estimated that the global cost of cybercrime was almost $2 trillion and that number will be $6 trillion next year. What that means is it's not going away. The next rule I want you to understand, I need every one of you to understand this. Cybercrime rule number one is everyone is a target. I was talking to one company uh, about six months ago and they said, well, we're not a target because our revenue is only $500 million. Of course, I sputter and say only $500 million. When you're talking about these cyber criminals coming out of countries like Nigeria, India, Pakistan, Vietnam, the drug cartels in Mexico are getting involved in this. One of the, the, the biggest motivator for this is financial gain. If they can get even a portion of your $500 million, they win. And, and so we need, to start, we need to start understanding that the other thing about ransomware and cybercrime is it's not a zero sum game. There's not a winner and a loser. If you get hit with ransomware and you, you don't pay the ransom, Neither of you win. And we need to start changing that conversation to make everybody understand that it's okay. You know, if you decide to pay the ransom, it's a business decision. I get it. I have an MBA. I, I understand that that's one of those costs that we, we figure in. But we need to also understand that by paying it, you're actually encouraging the cybercrime to continue. So having a different solution in case you get hit by ransomware is crucial going forward. Global cybercrime is rising at an exponential rate. Um, it doesn't necessarily take a rocket scientist to figure that. Of course, a lot of the people I talk to out at NASA would say, you know, something else. Um, but uh, this crime is not going to go away until we make it less lucrative. The problem, though, is on the backside, 
even though our uh, crime is going up at this exponential rate, our IT budgets really aren't increasing more than at a linear rate. And that makes it very important that when we're out there paying for things and buying cyber uh, security products, what you buy is the, more, is the most important decision you'll ever make, all right? Uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when we were building networks, we were spending 90% of our budgets on firewalls and routers. Uh, and we were putting a lot of money in that defense of the wall. I'm here to tell you that that wall will not defend you uh, enough. Uh, and I'm not saying that the firewalls aren't great and there's a lot of great next generation firewalls. But when you're looking at a limited IT budget, you are gonna have a better return on investment through things like user analytics, identity and access control, machine learning and intelligent systems. Those are gonna have a, a greater return and be a better product from a security standpoint than even things like risk and compliance and data loss prevention and encryption. So what you need to do is make sure you have trusted partners, companies like Datavox that will work with you to first determine what do you need? Don't fall into the, well, I call it the shiny light idea. Uh, sometimes you'll go to some of these trade shows and there are a lot of great products. I was at RSA this year and RSA, they're all these companies with great products. They look really good and they have shiny lights and they have all these people out there talking to me. But in the end, the question you have to ask yourself, does it help you get from point A to point B in your planned transformation? So it's very crucial to keep that, that goal in mind. Because the idea we have, first of all, we need to understand cyber threats will never be eliminated. Last year at RSA, the FBI director uh, got up and said, Chris Ray got up and said, this is bigger than the FBI. This is bigger than any country. And we need to, every, every individual company needs to start making cybersecurity the reality. So cyber threats aren't going away. How do I mitigate it? The biggest thing we need to look at is that I may not be able to prevent my people from clicking on links and, and for phishing to be successful. But what I can prevent is I can prevent that damage so that I can limit the, the, the criminal group inside a very small area. And so mitigation is where we have to be. So hybrid IT, you know, supply chains are a target, firmware is a target. Um, so as a criminal, and I'm a certified ethical hacker, and so as a certified ethical hacker, there's three things you wanna do when you hack into a network. There's three goals immediately. Number one, escalation of privilege. I want to get system administrator rights so that I can then uh, conduct whatever I wanna do. I can use RDP, I can use all sorts of other tools once I get sysadmin rights. Number two, I have to move laterally through the network and make sure that my malicious product or my remote access tool spreads as far as it can throughout that network so that when I set off whatever I'm gonna set off, that I get the maximum amount of damage. The third thing I wanna do is I need persistence. I need to find a way to get inside your computer in a way that you will not find me uh, should you start taking uh, appropriate actions or reboot the system. An example, we had a, a casino that got hacked by, it was a ransomware attack and they had good backups and, and uh, so they just kind of ignored the attack and they did a recovery. And it took them roughly a week to get the, 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 the system back online. And as soon as they turned the system back online, they got reinfected. And they said, well, that's weird. So we missed something. So they did it again. They wiped everything. They reloaded. They got hit again. So now they're like, all right, so now we have to go a little slower. So they're now in week three of recovery. They're bringing the systems up one at a time, one at a time, and then they get reinfected. It turns out that the, anti the virus, the, the ransomware, had stored a copy of itself inside of the thermostat of a saltwater uh, uh, fish tank. The, the malicious attackers are gonna look anywhere they can to hide their, their, their ransomware. It's gonna not just be in computers and servers and, and laptops and stuff like that. It's gonna be in printers, it's gonna be in routers, it's gonna be in the IoT devices that you have inside that network. So when you have to reload your system, you have to reload the entire system. Every device that's on that network has to be taken back down and have its software reflashed or redrawn. That's, that's the, the reality of it. So how are you gonna do that? What's your challenge? So what this brings up, it brings up this whole idea of what we call holistic security. Security is not just about people, processes, and products, right? Those are what we always have concentrated. Security is also about physical security. 
It's about risk and compliance. And now, you know, on January 1, Texas uh, signed a new, they, they actually updated their breach notification laws saying that you have to notify them. And I think it's if you have lose the data on more than 250 people, which is a very small number. But data security and data privacy, your security architecture, everything you, you're doing needs to have, take all of this into account. I tell, so I was talking to one customer recently and they said, well, we don't need security, we're, we're secure. I was like, okay, I, I hope so. I mean, of course, that's my hope. I really don't want something bad to happen to anybody. I said, when was the last time you had a third-party security evaluation? And he kind of crossed his eyes and looked at me and said, what do you mean? I was like, when did you hire a company from outside of your company to come in and do a full penetration test, including physical security? Well, that's not important. It is important. You need to have someone like a fresh set of eyes look at your network and to determine whether or not your network has very obvious and critical flaws and vulnerabilities. Um, sometimes if you have internal people testing it, they get a little bit of confirmation bias. They're like, well, I think it's good, I think we're okay, but you wanna know, and, and it becomes very important to do that. So security, uh, so what happens is that, is that then I have this report that as a security manager, I can go to the board or I can go to, you know, whoever's you know, holding the purse strings and say, listen, these are my vulnerabilities. These are my prioritizations for my next IT transformation. It becomes a lot easier to have those kind of conversations. Please do not overlook physical security. Physical security is, is, a, is a huge part of, of where you're man managing your data. If you have a data center, make sure that that data center is providing good security. Uh, example, um, I had one company here in town and I went out and I was uh, doing a ransomware investigation with them and I showed up at their front desk um, and no one's there. So I'm like, okay, I'm in. There's a guy sitting there and I'm like, how you doing? And I did it in a very authoritative voice and he goes, how you doing? And nobody ever accosts me and I don't have a badge on or anything. I walk through there into a workspace and behind the workspace is the server closet. Now, this particular place may manage software for some critical infrastructure. So if I had wanted to at that point in time, I could have literally pulled one of the servers out of the rack, taken it out the door before anybody found it. I could have powered it down. I could have put a USB device and re rebooted it and ripped all of the stuff through it. There's a, tons of, there's a ton of ways to do it. If I have physical access to your security network, I win, period. Please know that. Please understand that. All right, so when we're looking at data center security. So the HPE model starts, now we're gonna start getting into where HPE has sort of built its thought on, on data center security. Number one, we have to protect the data. Security follows the data, right? Data at rest, whether it's an encryption mechanism, data in flight, things like VPN. The challenge was how do we protect data while it's in use? Data in memory, data in cache. Those are critical places where bad guys have shown the ability to gain access to data. It's very important to know that we, we are working and we found some ways to protect the data in use. But at the same time, you have to know that your platform is trustworthy, is resilient, and it, it, there is visibility to the security uh, uh, platform that we're, we're on. Please understand this, a server is not a server is not a server. All servers are not created equal. If that was the case, then every company would be would just be one company out there that provided servers. There are differences in servers, and depending upon the security you need, you need to know what those differences are. But what's important is that we have to secure the platform and protect the data without compromising the performance of that server. Makes sense, right? In the good old days, 10, 15 years ago, we would start to install these host-based or these host-based intrusion software, personal firewalls and, and uh, antiviruses on these, these desktops, and they would actually have a negative impact on the performance of that desktop. What happened? The user would call and say, hey, my computer's running dog slow, what do I need to do? And a lot of times the IT staff would either disable that antivirus or disable that host-based intrusion, or they would tweak it down so that it gave you better performance. Security has to be built in without compromising performance. That's a must. So HPE said, well then, why, is, why are most security products only securing the apps, the OS, and the VM? 
isn't really security only as strong as the layer below it? And so we asked that question and that was that led us to where we, we are. We believe that security is only as, as strong as what's at the base. If the CPU is not secure, I can't really trust the BIOS and the firmware. I can't really trust the hypervisor and therefore the VM and the OS and the apps could be exploited. So what we did was we took our we make our own CPUs and our own firmware and and our own base management controllers and we actually take a fingerprint of that uh, the firmware that's on there the instruction set that's on there and take that hash of that and store it in a a, a silicon that is unwritable to anyone else outside of HPE and that what that allows us to do is it allows us to build a chain of trust all the way up the boot stack so what that what that looks like is is that we have a zero trust building from the hardware into the firmware of the server, and we are now building that firmware also to where anything installed by the uh, when you buy the server, including things like network cards and, and graphics cards, will also have that same fingerprint and have that same root of trust. Because we've seen a number of attacks where hackers have been able to get into the software download for a, 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 a BIOS. I think we had that with ASUS. Or we've seen that with them being able to get into graphics cards. There have been a number of attacks against, you know, some of the video card, you know, manu manufacturers where they've been able to download a uh, malicious software package through those. So if we can, if we can uh, make the hardware all the way, you know, uh, trustworthy and and uh, valid, then what we can also do is we can take if we can take that same hardware root of trust and extend it to all of the servers that, that have the same level of trust out to the edges. And we do that through our ILO amplifier pack and through InfoSight, which are machine learning products that help us manage our servers and make sure that, number one, all the servers are patched properly. Number two, that nobody has uh, downloaded something malicious into those servers. No one else offers that kind of product. So what that means is that HP's product is completely different from its competitor. We are two generations ahead of any competitor's server, and, and we are willing to, to you know, prove that. We've actually had that proven through a third-party penetration tester. What that means is that when you boot into an HPE server, there's a custom HPE chip that validates that the firmware stored inside of the CPU is correct, has not been, made, has not been uh, modified, and then we continue to use that fingerprint all the way up through the BIOS and into the operating system bootloader. Um, and we do that at boot, but in addition, we do that at runtime and no one else does that. So for example, the Intel boot guard, which is shown on the left side, there are manufacturers that use that and they say that is our root of trust. And we work with Intel and Intel boot guard is a good product, but I encourage you, if you think Intel boot guard is the way to protect you completely, go out on your favorite search engine and look for how do I bypass Intel boot guard? And I'm sure you'll find a number of, of uh, ways to do it. Intel boot guard is bypassable. There are ways to defeat it. It is not a root of trust uh, product. And Intel Boot Guard, one of its biggest limitations is in its name, it's only when you boot a machine. If your servers are like my servers, and I'm sure they are, you don't want to be rebooting your servers to check for you know, a malicious uh, software packages. And the bad guy doesn't want you rebooting the server either. They want to get their, they want to get their malicious software inside the firmware so that it, it just runs along with everything else and it looks almost transparent to the end user. So that's why the HPE product, we actually use the ILO security dashboard, which will manage all servers uh, you know, up to the, our Gen 10 silicon root of trust and, and uh, monitor them for their health and make sure that nobody has, has uh, uh, added additional software into any firmware product. We will also watch for rev levels we will watch for uh, who's logging in, uh, look for bad passwords on the management controller. It'll even look at, there's a lot of companies that will take their uh, management interface and put it directly on, on their network. Uh, and that's a really bad idea, um, but you do it because it's convenient. Well, convenience and security are divergent. I tell people that all the time. But if you're doing things that are for convenience sake, it's not being secure. So we offer this because we want to help you be more secure, but at the same time, the convenience we offer is through a security dashboard. In addition, we have uh, the InfoSight product, which is a machine learning analytics. And what's really cool about InfoSight, and then we just had our new version of it come out, 
is that it'll actually give you notification of what it thinks is getting ready to break. So let's say you have an old platter-based hard drive. Well, platter-based hard drives are spinning roughly 7,200 RPM. The, the machine learning inside of InfoSight will actually look at those hard drives, and if it sees one of them starting to get a little wobble or starting to go, get slow in speed, it will, it will notify you, or if you've set it up this way, it'll send an alert to HPE to send out a new hard drive. And sometimes people have actually found this hard drive come in, like, what is that for? And it's mapped out on the, on the slip that it's for an internal job ticket that was opened. So InfoSight has actually been shown to reduce the number of tickets opened uh, on network analytics by about 60%. So that helps, that helps you get more work done allows your IT staff to work on things that are more, more exciting than you know, hardware failures in the network. Uh, it also allow you to track firmware and driver updates. So it'll say, hey, there's a new firmware for X product. Uh, and then do you want to deploy it? So you have the ability to control it. Automatic firmware and driver updates are usually a bad idea just because you know, sometimes, the, the, we've, as we were talking about earlier, bad guys have been able to get in there. So these are all things built into our InfoSight product. So when we talk about implementation guide for Silicon Rooted Trust, we look at our Gen 10 products. Uh, and we're adding more and more products daily that are actually having our new servers built in. What's also cool is that we're gonna have new announcements uh, coming in June where Silicon Rooted Trust has actually been expanded uh, and it has more functionality. Uh, so uh, you know, keep your eyes out for that. Our ILO advanced license. Right now, ILO Advanced is free through the end of the year, uh, you know, so that if, if you buy a Gen 10 server, you get that ILO Advanced automatically, which is, is really a great feature, and it, it, it puts the toolbox on top of a really great server. Uh, but then we can, we'll go through, we'll help you review policy, and we'll try to help you take advantage of Cyber Catalyst. So based upon all of those things, HPE leads the industry. This is not something that we determined. This was something that was, was uh, pointed out by a third party uh, company that did a full penetration test of our new servers and compared them to our, our competitors across. Um, so we think that's one of the things that differentiates us. But if I did need one more than you know, more reasons, here's one. So we also, are, Aruba is actually part of the HPE product. And, H, and Aruba has the ClearPass product, which is a zero trust model in the most traditional sense but it goes much further than a lot of zero trust models. I talk to a lot of companies about zero trust and I talk to com other companies that have developed their own zero trust. The number one thing I tell them is your product has to be able to discover new devices when they're put on the network. Every one of us has had to deal with shadow IT. We have people in our network who don't wanna go through normal procurement. They wanna put a new device, they wanna put a new whatever on the network and they're gonna do it without telling your IT staff. So if you had a software product that was able to identify these products when they came online, fingerprint those products and try to identify what kind of product they are and then allow authorization authentication based upon that identity, wouldn't that be a good product? Well, absolutely. So for example, somebody plugs a web camera onto your network, um, you, know, you should be able to identify that it's a web camera based upon MAC address, based upon how that device functions or how that device tries to uh, communicate in your network. Therefore, all web cameras should be handled in the same way. When that device tries to do something different, which is unusual for a web camera, ClearPass will do an event triggered action, which will then quarantine that product until we can really identify it and, and allow for uh, you know, uh, more authentication. So this is a, is a great product, one of the best products out there. As a matter of fact, uh, it's been recognized by the insurance industry as being an exceptional product for security. In addition to that, we offer a thing called HP GreenLake. And what GreenLake is, GreenLake is a cloud um, a management product that allows um, you to monitor the usage of your cloud services. So what happens in, in a lot of right now in the current cloud environments, you still have to buy your own server, you still have to buy your own uh, your equipment, and then you map into a cloud environment. But in, in GreenLake, what you end up doing is, GreenLake, you lease the equipment from us, and we provide you a, a cloud environment that you can then manage and you can control uh, across all of your, your uh, departments. So for example, 
let's say you're a, uh, a hospital. So you and the IT department in a hospital, you purchase GreenLake, um, and then you can monitor the use a company was using the most data. So it's not just you know a capital outlay, it becomes an actual operational outlay. So you could then say on a monthly day, you could actually bill different departments inside your, your company with their monthly usage, which is what people want, right? I mean, so for example, if, 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 I'm, if I'm in your compliance group, I don't use a lot, I use, may use a lot of data, but I don't use, you know, I don't, um, I don't have more data. My stuff is fairly static. So my disk usage is pretty flat across. But if I'm like, let's say I'm an MRI department, where I'm constantly uploading these MRIs and, and loading them up into a, you know, into the cloud, my data usage is going up and expanding and, and contracting and expanding and contracting. Therefore, my usage would be higher. So GreenLake's a great model, great thing. So if you're looking at cloud environments, we'd encourage you to, you know, we can have a better conversation with you. Because one of the things about GreenLake is, is that now you, it greatly reduces your risk. You're not maintaining those servers anymore. We maintain the servers. So when there's an upgrade to the server, you don't have to go out and buy a brand new server. You just, we just update that server and you end up paying for the usage and not really, not that capital outlay. In addition, HP has built a number of partnerships and I think this is a really exciting partnership coming forward. In 2017, 2018, John Chambers, who's the former CEO of Cisco, built a new company called Pensando. And what he determined was he said that as we move our data closer to the edge, don't we want to be able to secure that data using like uh, firewalls? Well, the answer is typically yes, but most firewalls are extremely expensive. When you're looking at Palo Alto, for example, you know a high-end Palo Alto firewall could be $125,000. Um, so we need to make sure that, you know, so I don't want to spend that much money. So instead what they said is, what if we could take the entire functionality of a firewall and put it into a PCIe card and have it all centrally managed through a cloud-based app. That is the Pensando message. They are going to take a full function stateful firewall with encryption, micro segmentation, and put it into a PCIe card that is under $1,000 and installs it into an HPE server. That's a huge uh, market we think going forward. And those first, the first Pensando cards will be released within the next couple months. You're gonna start seeing more conversation around this Pensando marketing. And we are we are bought lock, stock, and barrel into Pensando. We actually are have a person on their board of directors because we really believe in this product. In addition, HP we we really feel like our product is the most secure product on on the on the planet. Uh, we've actually made that statement that we are the most secure server on the planet. But so what we want to do is we don't want to just talk, and because if we just talk, you think it's just a marketing you know ploy. So instead, what we did is we started talking to insurance companies. And we were talking to Marsh Insurance, and Marsh said uh, they were trying to establish a thing called Cyber Catalyst. And Cyber Catalyst um, is a, a solution that says, do, that asks the question, do some products provide a better, uh, provide a meaningful impact on cyber risk? If they do, then uh, shouldn't we recognize those and give you better cybersecurity insurance? So in doing that, they requested 150, 150 products. Hold on a second. You guys, hey, my window's open. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the working from home benefits, right? So, um, so they said that uh, they had 150 products and services submitted to them and uh, evaluated as to whether or not those devices had a meaningful impact on cyber risk. Uh, and in that, they've 17 of those products were designated as being uh, as actually having that meaningful impact. And in there, is, there's only one hardware vendor, HP Silicon Root of Trust, and the Aruba Policy Enforcement Firewall. So those are two products that we offer that are actually, if you have those, and they have to be over 51% of your products, then Marsh will actually provide you a, 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 a beneficial benefits to your cybersecurity insurance. So that's our holistic approach to cybersecurity and security in general. Um, we believe that security starts at the root, goes all the way up through the stack, and we also would help you uh, working with our partners like DataVox to provide better cybersecurity and to, um, to develop additional um, uh, compliance requirements going forward. 
if you want to know more about our cyber servers, uh, we actually do have uh, free server security workshops. Uh, the last one of the month is going to be on Monday, and then the May schedule should be coming out here soon. But if you're interested in it, let us know, and we can get you a free membership to that. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Hi, uh, James. I've got a few Q&A questions for you here that have come in along the way. Okay. So uh, we'll start here. Uh, you mentioned following a security framework. Uh, what yep. is the right yep. framework, and should it be based on my industry? Um, I'm going to answer the back half of the question first. Yes, I think the industry, you need to base it upon that industry. Um, so, I mean, if you're healthcare, if you're financial, um, your compliance requirements are different. Therefore, you are going to, you know, need to, uh, you know, uh, take a look at what the other group, other uh, frameworks that are using. For example, if you're not, if you're not complied by any of that, you can use things like NIST or SANS. Those are basic frameworks. Uh, but a lot of those groups, like financial, oil and gas, they have information sharing groups. Uh, the ISACs, IS, information sharing, yeah, uh, ISACs. Uh, you can actually go to them, see what they're using, uh, and actually uh, uh, share um, that data. Uh, the second thing is, is that, what was the first part of the question again? Sorry, I talked myself out of it. Um, what is the right framework, and should it be yeah. based on my industry? Um, I don't think there is a right framework. If I was, if I was to, uh, um, to look at frameworks overall, having a framework is the right answer. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, uh, if you're not, if you don't have any framework, you can even write your own custom framework, and it would make it somewhat more. Um, it, you would still be more secure than you were before. So that's that's my encouragement: is just start with something. I mean, I, I know companies. I've talked with some fairly good-sized companies that they literally started with just a pad of paper and said they 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 went out and found what they thought were the you know detect, protect, recover, and they started from there, and then just had a lot of brainstorming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kind of goes back to what you mentioned earlier. Ha having a plan is the first, the first yeah. uh, place. And you know, it's, what's interesting is, is that statistically, having a plan reduces the cost of your damages. Um, even having an instant response company on retainer lowers the cost of a breach by over a million dollars. Um, so uh, statistics show that it's a one in four chance that you're going to get hit in any one year um, by a cyber, by either a breach or a ransomware attack. So if you haven't been hit. It's a matter of time till you probably do get hit. Thank you. Uh, next question. What have you seen recently with uh, regards to customers turning back to tape for air-gapped data protection? You know, it's kind of funny. Um, uh, I mean, I laugh about, about it, but, uh, you know, yeah, I, you, you do see some of it. You see some people going back to that, but it doesn't necessarily even have to be, you know, an air-gapped tape network. I mean, you know, DLTs are, are, have been a thing, and I mean, I Back in the day, I did four millimeter and eight millimeter. Um, so it's it's uh, the problem with tape is uh, if it's an archival, how long is it going to last? Um, so you got to make sure that you're storing that correctly. I'd be interested to see. I would imagine in Texas that uh, the high humidity actually has a negative impact on tapes if you're not using a climate controlled uh, uh, offsite. But I would say having the offsite copy is the most critical thing you could do, or uh, using a product that doesn't maintain a constant connection between itself and its backups. So like we have a some number of products, I think like our SimpliVity product that doesn't, uh, its backup VMs are not directly connected to the hypervisor, but there's a lot of products like that that would work. Next question is um, an interesting one here. So it says some of the biggest violators of IT security policy are the business owners or executives. In the 20 years with the FBI, you know, your experience there, what was the percentage of these violators and what action was taken against them? Yeah, so yeah. What's, kind of, what's kind of interesting is, is that from a criminal standpoint, uh, there wasn't a lot of prosecution against them because uh, most po policy isn't law, and there aren't a lot of laws out there that allow us to go after somebody for violating those policies. So typically, the, the violators of policy um, were managed internal to their network. Um, but what's actually has shown to be more, has uh, been become more useful, that's the rise of these privacy laws. So uh, what's actually starting to, to put more of a lean, especially on business owners, are things like GDPR in Europe and uh, uh, the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act. 
those are actually having more of an impact on improving IT security policies than anything. Uh, and so GDPR, for example, went after, I think it was British Airways, and fined them $150 million. Um, Marriott, uh, uh, on their that, that first breach, the one they had a couple of years ago, it's uh, estimated they will probably get hit with a $150 million uh, fine as well. The fines is what's going to have them. Uh, also, what we started to see is that the SEC, for publicly held companies, the SEC is going after companies who are not following cybersecurity policies, and they're using the Sarbanes-Oxley rules. Uh, so that has a lot of weight. And they just sent out a guidance this week about uh, the requirements for those SEC and what, what penalties are going to start coming. So I think you're going to start seeing a lot more of that. Um, but the problem with policy is that policy isn't law. And so the FBI has almost no uh, right to go after it. Golden example, um, I had a higher education group here in Houston. They called me and they said, we have a guy who's uh, stealing data. And I said, okay, let talk me through it. They said, yeah, he's uh, copying his data to a, uh, a cloud service in China. And I was like, okay. So if he's actually a criminal, um, it's a pretty dumb criminal that directly uh, transfers their data to their destination country. So that would have been, that was kind of the first clue to me that this guy probably wasn't actually stealing it. I said, so how's he getting access to the data? They're like, well, he has access as part of his job. I said, so you gave him access to the data? Yes. And he's still employed by the company? Yes. So what law did he break? Well, we think he's getting ready to quit. Okay. This is a total policy question. <laughs> this has nothing to do with it. And it turned out what this guy was doing was he was getting ready to quit. He was uploading all of his research into a cloud provider in China before he quit you know, the company. Um, that's a policy question, and that has to be managed internally. Perfect. Uh, next one. Do you foresee a future where the, where the IT systems are fully automated and require no or little human intervention? Um, I don't think I don't think 100%. Um, I think um, I think you're going to see uh, you're going to see more machine learning coming in, and that's mainly because of the massive amounts of data being pumped now into these EOCs. Um, so a lot of these EOCs they have uh, machine learning that will then uh, try to cull out the the positives and the and hopefully the the false positives, um, and then let them rewrite the tools and kind of throw it back in. I mean, that's really the idea of things like Splunk is the ability to sort of massage the data going forward. Um, but actually, I read a great, a great quote that says, uh, AI needs humans to defend it. So even if we get into more of an AI type and machine learning type model, which I think you're going to see a lot more of that coming, the humans still have to be there to help defend it against attacks. So I don't think you'll ever see full automation. Okay, uh, next question. We've got quite a few here. You're uh, muted. Oh, okay. no. Can you hear me? Yep. Is, is so HPE, you're, good, you're good now. You can, you're up now, yeah. Is HPE's zero trust security model vendor agnostic? Um, which, which vendor are we talking about? So, it's, it's a, so if you're talking ClearPass, the software ClearPass, I think, yes, it will run on Cisco. Um, I think it'll revolt and tell you all sorts of harsh, you know, use harsh language with you. Um, but it, uh, ClearPass does run outside of HPE servers, if you're talking about the software element. Yeah, it, I, I think the nature of the question is, um, if there's an HPE published zero trust security model, is that model built around a multi-vendor environment? Uh, there is not a published one, and it is not based upon that. Um, because Silicon Root of Trust is unique to uh, the, our new servers, um, it's not it's not, not transferable into any other environment at this point in time. Next question: What are your Let's thoughts on micro segmentation in data centers? Sorry about that. Um, so, what are my thoughts on micro segmentation? Yes. Is that, oh, it, it, it's, it's a it's a you, must. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I mean, it, and that's where, like, even with the, the Pensando, uh, there will be micro segmentation built into um, the the network card. Micro segmentation, I think, is one of the best defenses uh, for uh, mitigating losses across a enterprise. 
Um, so for example, if I, if I break into, let's say your financial sector, uh, your financial group, um, there is no way that I should be able to get out of that financial group and spread it into other areas. Um, it's just that, that we have to be able to compartmentalize. Um, I would even, I've even said, you know, and this is a pain, don't get me wrong, but is micro segmentation of uh, administrator rights so that administrators have to continue to, uh, you know, they'd have to log in separately across that. And most zero trust models require multiple logins. And I think you're going to see more and more of that. Um, I was going to answer this question here about uh, if money is a motivator, how can we stop a good ethical hacker turning into a bad guy for monetary gains? What the thing I would say, first of all, is more bug bounty programs. Um, uh, bug bounties, I think, are a great way to encourage hackers to go after, you know, and, and gain some cred at the same time, uh, uh, not break the law. Uh, for example, DOD does it all the time. I think they just had a big bug bounty program. I think they had 250 something bounties paid out. Um, so like I tell, when I'm talking to high schoolers and college folks all the time, I was like, you know, become an ethical hacker and use your skills for good. I've also, an idea that I've thrown out, it probably doesn't have a whole lot of, you know, wash is I think we should put uh, bounties on the heads of some of these criminal hacker groups outside the United States and then let people in the United States actually, actually register as uh, bounty hunters and go after them. I think that would be a, a great model going forward. So, you know. Yeah. Perfect. Well, um, we, we've got a few other questions here, but we're right up against the hour. So we'll probably have to address those outside of the, outside of the event. But certainly yeah, just email, email them over or whatever, and then we can keep the conversation going offline. Perfect. We'll definitely do that. I definitely appreciate you um, helping us put the event on, James. A lot of really good stuff. Cool. Uh, for those for those folks that have been on the call, uh, that were also part of some of our some of our other webinars, we've had a strong focus on cybersecurity because it's such a relevant topic. Um, we actually had one this morning that was around user awareness training, and a lot of similar um, uh, data points were brought up by James uh, during this event that people like to attack people when they're vulnerable. And James mentioned the hurricane scenario, so very similar messaging. Um, you know, training, awareness, creating a plan, all these things are really important. Uh, we'd love to help you out with those things. Uh, something, again, that James brought up earlier was the, ability, the need to also think about your physical security environment and Databox is uniquely positioned there, having a physical security practice along with a cybersecurity practice. So uh, let us help come in and consult with you and, and uh, blend both of those strategy, strategies together into a single cohesive strategy. So. Um, very much appreciate it, and over to you, Jessica. Thank you so much, Greg, and thank you all for joining today's webinar. As a reminder, the recording link for today's session will be emailed to all attendees 24 to 48 hours post-event. If you did enjoy today's session and would like to hear more, we do offer new, new webinars weekly. Please check our Databox website for more information on upcoming sessions. And as always, we would love to hear your feedback on our events. Once this webinar has ended, you will be redirected to a survey page. If you could please take a moment to complete the survey before closing out your browser, we would greatly appreciate it. That concludes our session for today. Thank you again to James for a great presentation and thank you all for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for having me.